Welcome back. You're watching Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. Our guest tonight is Miriam Inachiroma, a former Minister for Women Affairs and former woman leader in the PDP. Now, Hadji, just before we went on break, you were talking about, you know, how token, it is tokenism for women to just be given forms. What more do you think should be done to encourage grassroots women, not just high-profile women whose husbands have names, of course, but also women who are willing to take a ticket from the grassroots? Well, I think um, a lot of things need to be done to encourage um, uh, our grassroots women to participate in politics. Um, they need to be encouraged uh, to be able to understand they also need to contribute, especially those that are interested in contributing by uh, Mentoring. We need to mentor a lot of men, especially those that have excelled in politics. They can mentor a lot of women and support them, um, especially uh, in the area of elective posts to, to like uh, the council in the, in the local government council areas. We can start from that, ensure that we have a lot of women in the local government council areas, and then we have the state assemblies. So if we're able to encourage women to, to, to participate actively in politics, uh, I think it's good. One of the problems I see is that, you know, men, they can resign from any appointment to venture into politics. They just resign and they jump in. But I think women are very cautious. Even if they are interested in politics, they find it difficult to leave their jobs and uh, go into an area they are not certain of getting what they want. Uh, we must be bold to, to come out and participate because if you don't participate, nobody will go and ask you to come and do it. Uh, you must show interest. So to show interest means uh, that you, you, are, you are ready to forgo maybe your appointment, even if it's a juicy, just forget it and jump into politics. We want more women uh, to participate in politics. So uh, they need to be encouraged to be able to come out and participate. Let's talk about one area that you, know, you have also overseen, which is the Ministry of Women Affairs. For a lot of Nigerian women, they would wonder what precisely is the impact of that ministry. It's supposed to worry about their development, but from what we've seen so far, it looks like it's only meant to reward um, the, the, the female stalwarts of the winning party. Uh, well, the ministry has a policy um, of how they're supposed, to be, they're supposed to conduct their affairs. So I don't think it is, it is that, because it's just like any other ministry. They have programs, they have activities, they handle issues affecting women. Um, so uh, it's not just a ministry that's not doing anything. Um, they have a lot of things to do, and they are doing it. Uh, when I was there, when we came up with the national gender policy, um, a lot of things were done uh, in the ministry to ensure that um, women's um, uh, uh, women's issues were taken care of. We tried, to, in fact, we ensured that in, in every ministry, every budgetary allocation to the ministry, they must have um, something for that will take care of the women in the ministry. And we, we also try to track that so that women issues are also um, are taken care of. Uh, apart from that, you know that um, the ministry also spearheaded the idea of having the 35 percent uh, affirmative action uh, to be enshrined in our constitution. Since then, we've been struggling with that. Uh, of course, it was in the National Assembly, and you know what happened recently. When, well, the when, question, your question will be, how does that really affect? Um, yes, we, we can have 35% affirmative action. I have constantly inquired as to how having, and it's very lovely to see women in government, don't mm. get me wrong, mm. but how does that really affect the plight of the ordinary woman, apart from the inspirational purpose of mm -hmm. knowing that women are there and they mm -hmm. can do it as well. Mm -hmm. But aside that, what really, what basic impact does it have on, have on the life of the average Nigerian woman? Yes, um, the ministry honestly has a um, lot of uh, activity that affects the ordinary Nigerian woman, especially, you know, you remember in the, when this HIV thing started, the ministry was actively involved in ensuring that women's health issues were really taken care of. In the, um, the MDGs, the Ministry of Women Affairs were involved in, because if you look at the, the Millennium Development Goals then, all the, all the things that were listed as um, programs for the Millennium Development Goals, almost six of them affects women. And the Ministry um, was actively involved in that, affect, uh, taking care of issues 
that affect women, maternal mortality, a lot of things. The minute, every minister of women affairs goes around the country to talk with state representatives, the state ministries, to see how the ministries are working, especially uh, as it affects um, children's health, women's health issues, girl child education. You understand? But you, the indices are still poor. Uh, you are representing, you are hoping to be a deputy national chairman of the PDP, representing the North as well. Mm -hmm. You do know that the plight of the average Northern girl, you know, it's not very bright when you, when you look at the indices that we see uh, released by, say, the NBS or even, say, the United Nations. How do you think that, you know, the Ministry for Women Affairs can affect those indices in such a way that they begin to look better? Yes, as I said, the, the ministry will have to collaborate with the state governments because uh, when we talk about um, uh, things that affect ordinary Nigeria, you must go to the grassroots where Nigerians generally are. So you must liaise with the state ministry to, to see how, they are, how their programs and activities are affecting girl child especially. Uh, and I can tell you that... Um, when I was the Minister for Women Affairs, I went around, especially about girl child education, to see how, uh, especially in the northern areas where we have issues of girl child education, and it was improving, honestly, it was improving. So in one state that I went to, the governor told me that one of their problems was, in fact, getting the, the schools to, because they are shortage of schools, they, have, they are churning out so many girls that want to proceed to secondary schools. So that one, also, there was a problem of infrastructure. And they also came up with a policy that even if a girl gets married, she can still continue with her education. Because, you know, in those days, if you are married, that's the end of your education. But a policy was, um, came out and there was a lot of campaign to also sensitize the husbands, the parents, to encourage these girls, even if they are married, they can still go back to school. Would you say that it has improved from the time you were there? Till now? Yeah, it has improved. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, would you also say that fellow women have been supportive of your ambition to be oh, oh yes. Deputy National Chair? Oh, yes. I've never seen anything like that. In fact, I think it is um, something that it has not happened amongst women. The women are so united on this uh, to ensure that that position is secured for women uh, because we know that if we don't get ourselves together, we'll always be shortchanged in the political arena. Why? Because as we talked about zoning, positions are zoned to the various um, regions in this country, to the sub-zones, micro-zoning, whatever. In all these zones, women's interests were not taken care of. It does not no matter. It's zoned to this particular state, and before you know it, a man is picking it. So this particular position that the women are able to fight for, you can see that women in the PDP are solidly united and they are ready to fight for this position. Does it include all the former women leaders? Are they behind you? Yeah, everybody. Not, not only the women leaders, everybody. And you can bank on them? Yes, I can. So if you lose the position for whatever reason, mm -hmm. would you be contesting it? Well, it depends on how I lose it. If I lose it um, during the political process, election, and then the delegates refuse to elect me, there's nothing I can do. That is politics, and that is democracy. But if I am denied, because I'm a woman, that's when I will not accept it. That's when I will not accept it. If somebody says she's a woman, she cannot go in there, I will not agree. But from what you've seen so far, from the processes that have been laid down, mm -hmm. well, I, I don't know if the, you know, the, the, the process is going to be is being laid down, but at least from the people that have been constituted into the subcommittee, are you happy with what you've seen so far? I have not seen the list yet. I have not seen it. But I don't think um, I have issues with that. I will not have, because they are all party members. And uh, as I can tell you that the, the key word for every PDP member is that free and fair. They should be free and fair to everybody. Because we know if we don't get this convention right, it is going to spell doom for the party. Well, that's a fine place to leave it. Haji Miriam in Ashirama, thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you so much. Well, that's the program tonight. We want to hear from you. In your opinion, do you think the PDP can put its house in order before 2019? Talk to us using the handles on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Maupe Ogun. Good night.